Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's service. We're delighted to see you. I hope you had a pleasant day. Somebody say yes. I had a quiet day, a day with God. I prayed for you and have been praying for you, particularly those of you who've answered the appeals that have been made, and they have been very tough, direct appeals. I've been praying that God will keep you steadfast in the decisions you have made with regard to him. We're fast coming to the end of this blessed series, so I hope you will make all arrangements to be here tomorrow night and on Sabbath. And if you've not yet brought someone with you, please ask God to touch the heart of a friend or family member, then invite that person. You may be surprised that that formerly hard person will say yes. Let me repeat that. When you invite people to come to service and you think the person is likely to say no, pray first and ask God, give me favor in the sight of this person. Then invite the person. I was conducting an evangelistic series a few years ago on Loma Linda's campus and I was doing some counseling and a lady came to me and she said, pray for my son. I said, well, where's your son? Why didn't he come? How old is he? She said, 35. I said, well, tell him I want to see him. He's a man. She said, he won't come. I said, why do you say that? She said, he's my son. I know him. He won't come. I said, madam, here's what you do. You pray to God and you claim Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. You pray that prayer. You tell God. Take the heart of your son and turn it in favor of the invitation. The very next night, the man was in my office. Someone else came to me. A prayer for my children. I said, what's wrong with your children? Well, they're such and such. How old are they? 24 and 25. Why didn't they come themselves? They won't come. How do you know that? I am their father or their mother. They won't come. I said, here's what you do. You pray to God first and you say, Lord, you said... The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it with us or ever he will. You tell God, turn the hearts of my children to accept this invitation the next night. They were in the office. Now, the Bible verses are not to be used to manipulate God, but God always respects his word. So if there's someone whom you'd like to see come in the last two days of this series, you pray first. It may be your husband or your wife. And you say, Lord, soften the heart of this person. Turn the person's heart towards this invitation. Then invite the person. You may have a testimony to shout before this series is over. Our subject for tonight, who is your God? Who is your God? Before I begin, all those of you with cell phones, please turn them off. I did not even bring mine. Please turn your cell phones off. By the way, thank you very much. As far as I can recall, I did not hear a cell phone go off last night. So God bless you for your cooperation and your willingness to assist me. Tonight, let's repeat that record. All cell phones, please turn off, not on vibrate, off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, please pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, I'd like you very much to think. Please think. When God made man in his image, he gave him the capacity to think and reason and make intelligent choices. So please think as you listen to the word of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we ask in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ, that you would come very close to us in the person of your Spirit. We need the direction, the light of the Spirit, in order that we may understand the message tonight. Speak through me, dear God, and let the truth you place in my lips enter the hearts of those who are listening. Father, let your truth triumph tonight. Let hard hearts be softened. Let them bow to the moving of the Spirit on their hearts, so that you may be glorified and we may be blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is your God? How does a person determine who his God or her God is? It is not simply by saying, this person is my God or that person is my God. 
What comes from the lips comes out too easily. Remember the complaint of Jesus Christ in Matthew 7, uh, Mark 7 and Matthew 15. This people draweth nigh unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God is tired, sick. Well, God can't be sick to death, but he's sick of lip service. Everybody loves Jesus. I've never met someone in the Christian community who did not love Jesus. Everyone loves Jesus Christ. How do you determine who your God is? Who is your God? That's what we will try to examine this evening. Go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 4. Well, let's go to chapter 3. We shall read from verse 9. God has called Moses to go on a mission. The mission is to go to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh politely but firmly to release God's people, the Israelites. It was not God's desire to bring all these plagues upon Egypt. God would have preferred that Pharaoh obeyed him the first time. That's the way God is. God prefers to bless And not curse. And so in chapter 3, verse 9 of the book of Exodus, the Bible says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayst bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God is calling Moses to go on this delicate mission. Verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I shall go unto Pharaoh? And that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. His first excuse is, I am not worthy. Who am I? I am no one. I am a little person. I can't go into the presence of the mightiest monarch on earth at that time. And demand that he get rid of his entire slave population. That was probably the backbone of the economy of the land of Egypt. Who am I? Says Moses. That was an excuse. Then God gives him reassurance in verse 12. In verse 13, Moses has another excuse. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shall thou say to the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. So God answers his second excuse. Now let's go to chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. We shall read from verse 10. Moses first says he's not worthy to go. Then Moses says, well, I don't have a name to give the Israelites because they've forgotten your name. God deals with both. Now Moses presents a third reason why he should not go on this mission. And God is so merciful that he's long-suffering with Moses. Exodus chapter 4 verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses' third excuse is, I cannot speak. The Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And God answers his third excuse. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And Moses is still refusing to give himself to this mission. Verse 14 of Exodus 4. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. God is going to great lengths to reassure Moses, if I send you, I will provide the resources you need. Verse 16. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. Listen very carefully to Exodus 4.16. As we continue with, who is your God? And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee, instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him, finish the verse for me, instead of God. Now, God tells Moses, you will be a God to Aaron. 
Of course, we understand God did not mean that Moses would be divine. What God is saying in the role that you would be carrying out at my direction, you will be functioning as a God because you will be doing what I do. Now, I want you to follow me closely and think. Our subject is, who is your God? Why did God say to Moses, you will be a God to Aaron? Let's go to chapter 7, reading verse 1. Exodus 7, reading verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Here again, God tells Moses, You will be a God to someone. In chapter 4, verse 16, you will be a God to Aaron. In chapter 7, verse 1, you will be a God to Pharaoh. Why was Moses a God to Aaron and a God to Pharaoh? Look at verse 15 again of Exodus 4. Let's pick up some clues that are very obvious. Exodus 4, verse 15. And God tells Moses, and thou shalt speak unto him. And do what? Put words in his mouth. What does that mean? When God tells Moses, you will speak to Aaron and put words in his mouth. That being the case, we could expect that Aaron would only speak what? The words that Moses gave to him, and of course the words that Moses gave to, Pharaoh, to Aaron were the words that Moses got from God. So God was a God to Moses, and God is God. Then God says, Moses, what I did to you, you do to Aaron. Are you with me? Are you with me? We're in the back. All right, let me say it again. God is telling Moses, I will be with your mouth. And I want you to be with Aaron's mouth by putting words in his mouth. So what I do to you, you at a human level, you do to Aaron. In that sense, you will be a God to Aaron. So Moses was a God to Aaron, a role play in the sense that Moses told Aaron not only what to say, but what to do. I hope someone is praying and said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth because I need it. Let me repeat. Moses was a God to Aaron and to Pharaoh because Moses was put in a position to give commands to Aaron and to give commands to Pharaoh whether they obeyed or not. Moses was commissioned by God to command Aaron what to say and to command Pharaoh what to do. In that sense, God said, you will be a God to Aaron and a God to Pharaoh. A God is someone who is in a position to command and direct his subjects. Are you with me? And Aaron would be the prophet of Moses or would be Moses' mouthpiece or spokesperson as we're informed in verse 16 of chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. And Aaron, being a faithful, obedient servant, would say exactly what Moses said and would do exactly what Moses said. Between Moses and God, Moses would do exactly what God said. He would speak the words of God. He would do the acts of God. In the role play as God, Moses would command Aaron and Aaron would do exactly what Moses said, carry out Moses' instructions to the letter. Moses was a God to Aaron because Moses gave Aaron's com Aaron commands to carry out. Who is your God? Your God is the person whose commands you obey. Let me say it differently. Your God is the one who tells you what to do and you do it. Your God is not the person you say you love. I really hope you're following. As I said earlier, everybody loves Jesus Christ. Your God, I repeat, is not the person you say you love. Your God... And my God 
is the person or the thing that directs and commands our lives. There are some people who say the God of heaven and earth is their God, but their lives are directed by their career. You don't see them at church. They don't study the Bible. They hardly pray. They couldn't defend the basic doctrines of the church to which they belong. They're not making preparations for the second coming of Christ. Yet they, all, they love to say, I love Jesus. God is my God. But all their efforts, all their resources, all their time, all their sacrifices is in the direction of something or someone other than God. Your God and my God is not the person we say we love. Your God and my God is the person or the thing that drives our lives and commands us and we obey. So your God can be your education. Because it takes more of your time than your time with the God of heaven and earth. Your God can be your spouse. Your God can be fashion. Your God or my God can be getting ahead. Keeping up with the Joneses and the Smiths. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And see whose God was Adam's God and Eve's God. Genesis 3. Well, let's read from verse 2. Listen to the command, the very first command given in the Bible. Genesis 2, reading from verse 16, our subject is, Who is your God? Do we have Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 16, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And you and I are well familiar with this passage of scripture. God spoke unequivocally, nothing confusing. Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, just one tree, thou shalt not eat of it. And the Bible says it was a command. And we said earlier, your God is the one who commands you and you obey. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now that was what God said. That was God's command. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Genesis 3, reading from verse 1, it's 10 minutes after 7. I got up about five minutes too late tonight. I'll try not to punish you. It wasn't your fault. I'll see how the Spirit leads. Do we have Genesis 3 verse 1? The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God what? Said. Did God speak? Did God issue a command? Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now we have two words. God said, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. The serpent said, the instrument of the devil, if you eat, ye shall not surely die. In other words, he was telling Eve, eat. And God told her, don't eat. God's command was, don't eat of the tree. The devil's invitation was, eat of the tree. God's words were, if you eat, you suffer. The devil's words were, if you eat, you'll experience blessings. By the way, when Satan tempts us to disobey, he does not show us the dark side of disobedience. He produces benefits to disobedience. Now listen to me, there are no benefits to disobedience. Not one. But Satan is very good in packaging. You walk down the supermarket aisle, you know, the cereals, they're all brightly colored. They're not in black and white boxes. Who would buy them? 
There was a movement in Canada several years ago to put cigarettes in black and white boxes to dissuade people from buying them. And now, I think in Brazil, I think somewhere they put uh, very ugly images on cigarette boxes, people's lungs in terrible conditions, and their mouths and their throats, some, some horrid images. They're trying to do that in the United States. Of course, the tobacco industry is fighting back. So Satan, he packages his temptations in such a way that they look beneficial. What was it he said to Eve in verse 5 of Genesis 3? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so he presented benefits to disobedience, and of course there are no benefits to disobedience. God said, don't eat. The devil said, eat. Eve had to choose which voice to obey. And the voice she chose would be her God until she repented. You didn't hear me. I am sure when she agreed to eat in disobedience to God, if someone had asked her, do you love God? She would have said yes. I love Jesus with the fruit in her hand and between her teeth. I love God. God said one thing, Satan said another, and from then until now, my beloved brothers and sisters, every man, every woman, particularly those who claim a relationship with God, you and I are faced with, shall I do what God says or shall I do what someone else says? It is that simple. There aren't three voices in the world. There are two, the voice of God and the voice of Satan. And if the voice you're listening to is not biblically based, which makes it the voice of God, it is the voice of Satan. May come through a friend, may come through political commentator on television, may come through a family member, may come through a colleague on the job. If it differs from the voice of God, its source is satanic, it is the voice of Satan. And so Eve listened to the voice of the devil. And in doing that, she made Satan her God. Because your God is the person whose command you obey, whose voice you follow, whose instructions you abide by. And now she goes to Adam. And Adam, of course, we know he joins her in her sin. She was deceived. He was not. But the outcome was the same. They were both put out. The law doesn't care if you sin accidentally or deliberately. Now, I know you didn't get that. Let me say it again. The law does not care if you sin deliberately or accidentally. Because an ignorant sin is still a sin. Are you with me? Now, God may not charge you with it, but an ignorant sin, and I'm just digressing a little bit, an ignorant sin is still a sin. That's why God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Yes, in the times of ignorance, what does God do? He winks, but now commandeth all men everywhere. God is not pleased when someone continues to sin ignorantly because sin, deliberate or ignorant, it hurts, it destroys. So the law is not concerned if you sin ignorantly or deliberately. Once there's sin, the punishment is death. Now God is concerned. So when you sin ignorantly, Christ takes that. So Eve sinned ignorantly, she was put out. Adam sinned deliberately, he was put out. Here's what God told Adam. Genesis 3, verse 17. As we continue, who is your God? And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. God's voice had said, In the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. The voice of his wife, while it is not actually recorded in the Bible, we can reasonably assume she told him, eat. But her voice was whose voice? Come on, speak with confidence. Her voice was whose voice? The voice of Satan. I don't care how pretty she was, how melodious her voice. If what she said was contrary to what God said, all she said, however musically she said it, was from Satan. And so God said to Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. A lot of people will not serve God because of a spouse. 
Some wives want to come to church, give their lives to Christ. The husband is not in favor, so the wife is intimidated. She stays home or stays away. The husband wants to come. The wife is brokenhearted. He wants to please the wife. He stays away from God. More people refuse to give their lives to Christ because of family pressure than you would imagine. And I see it all over the world. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And there's a lesson there for us. Regardless of how close a relationship may be, it does not constitute justification to disobey God. I said that clumsily. Let me try it again. God doesn't care whether it's your husband, your wife, your in-law, your ex-wife, whoever. If that person's voice differs from God's voice, you should not obey it. Your man was a little uncertain, but I understand. And so God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, because you went contrary to my command by listening to somebody else's. Listen to me. The only way to go contrary to God's command is to obey another command. Now, I know you have to think about that. Let me say it again. I told you a few nights ago, you might remember, the Bible, I have seen in the Bible something I call the law of opposites. Jesus said, full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Are you with me? The only way to keep your tradition is to reject God's word. The only way to keep God's word is to reject your tradition. And so God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, curses the ground for thy sake. By listening, you disobeyed me by listening to someone else. And that person who represented Satan, that meant that Satan in your act of disobedience was your God. Satan in their sin was their God. Until they repented. Because thou hast hearkened Unto the voice of thy wife. But even before God said that, there's something else God said, which you and I need to understand. Let's go to verse 9 of Genesis 3. As we continue, who is your God, 20 minutes after 7. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Think of what I just said. Who told thee? What is God implying? What is it when God said, who told you? What can you conclude? I did not tell you. Are you with me? And if I didn't tell you, says God, you should know. You're not following me tonight. Are you following me? Well, try to look as if you are. God says, who told you that thou was naked? His implication is, I didn't tell you anything. Whatever you need to know, I will tell you. And if you are now aware you were naked, somebody else told you. And it wasn't me. Who told you to worship on Sunday? No, this is not funny. You see, there are only two voices. I've told you that, the voice of God or the voice of Satan. Now, if God didn't say Sunday's a holy day, who said it? When I travel overseas to preach, I'm confronted with people with more than one wife in the church. And I frequently have to ask, who told you to marry two wives? Show me where God said it. And if God didn't say it, Satan told you. I don't care how you wrap up Satan's words in tradition and custom and tribal habits. I don't care. I don't mean to be harsh. I just don't care. You show me where God said to do what you're doing. And God said to Adam, who told you? And God is asking you and me tonight, who told you to do what you're doing? On whose authority are you doing it? 
Because the person's authority represents your God and mine. Who told you to regard Sunday as the Sabbath? When the Bible says it's the seventh day of the week. Who told you to eat pork? Here again, someone listening will say, he's legalistic. I am not legalistic. Somebody say amen. <laughs> God is a God of details. Ellen White writes, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 479, God sh- paragraph 2. God shut Moses out of Canaan to teach a lesson which should never be forgotten, that he requires exact obedience. Let me ask you this. If God put Adam out of the garden for one sin, can he let you into heaven with one? Who told you? The person who told you is your God. A lot of people will be shocked in the judgment. You know what they'll say? Lord, Lord, (laughs) Matthew 7, 21. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Can you imagine Jesus looking you in the eye and telling you, after reading your resume of good works, I never knew you. And today... There are people who are in this precise position. They are serving another God but claiming Christ. They have a long resume, a CV of all the things they've done. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Meaning you're not mine because he knows everything. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, claiming the name of God. In Exodus 32, first six verses, when the Israelites made the golden calf with Aaron in the leadership of this infidelity to God, they dedicated the calf and the day of idol worship to God. Did you hear me? They dedicated the day to God. Reading some time ago, this man, let me be very careful what I say. It's a statement, no, from a statement from a church organization. I won't call the name of the church. They uh, ordain homosexuals. And they put out a statement I have on my computer because I can't believe it. They said, in a committed, monogamous, homosexual union, the image of God can be seen. I'm paraphrasing. Did you hear what I just said? In a monog meaning, you're faithful to the same person in sin. You follow me. A a committed, monogamous, homosexual relationship, the image of God can be seen. The same God who burned up Sodom and Gomorrah, destroyed the antediluvians, And it's coming to destroy the modern cities for the same reason. There are people worshipping Satan and calling the name of God. I ask you tonight, who is your God? John 14, 15 does not say, if ye love me, love me. When you study the Bible sometimes, look at a verse and try to think, what does the verse not say? If ye love me, love me. That's the way people read John 14, 15. Because we assume love is a feeling. If you love me, says Jesus, love me. What does Jesus say? If ye love me, keep my commandments. There's another way about to say keep my commandments. If ye love me, stop sinning. You didn't get it? Let me explain. What is sin? So when you keep the commandments, you're not transgressing. If you love me, what's my version? Stop sinning.
There is only one way to demonstrate love to God. And I repeat, and I don't speak with pontifical authority. I'm just leaning on the Bible. There is only one way to demonstrate love to God. One. Give me one word. Obedience. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1072, Paragraph 8, Ellen White writes, Why cannot they who claim to understand the Scriptures see that God's requirements under grace is just the same He made in Eden, perfect obedience to His law? Who is your God? Your God is the person or the thing you obey. When Eve listened to Satan's voice and she coveted that fruit, she broke just about every commandment in the book. By listening to Satan, Satan became her God in that moment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, she broke that. Because your God is the one who tells you what to do. Are you listening to me? I told you a few nights ago what God writes in the heart during the message, heart to heart. He writes the law. That's all he writes. If all he puts in your heart is the law, what does he want from you? Obedience. That's all he wants. Do what I say. Eve did what Satan said. Satan wants the same thing. Do what I say. God says, do what I say. And so when she listened to the voice of Satan, she broke commandment one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. When she coveted the tree, which is commandment 10, she also broke commandment two, idolatry. Because Ephesians 5 verse 6 says, for this we know that no homonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater. A covetous person engages in idol worship because he or she worships the thing he or she covets. Do you follow me? And so by coveting, it became her idol. She broke commandment one, commandment two. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. She was probably claiming to be God's child because she told the devil, yes, God said. She was defending God. But obeying Satan. How did she break the Sabbath? When someone else becomes your God, you no longer depend on God. Are you with me? Let me say it again. If, you ch- if this is God, and this is an idol, and you worship the idol, you are depending on the idol, not God. The principle of the Sabbath is the principle of dependence. Every created thing depends on God. For its existence, its sustenance. Let me say it again. That's why the Sabbath existed before the commandments were written. Because the principle existed, as long as there is a creation, there must be the principle of dependence. Ellen White writes in um, Councils and Dads and Foods, page 56, paragraph 2. He is caring for us every moment. He keeps the living machinery in action. If we were left to run it for one moment, we would die. We are absolutely dependent upon God. The Sabbath principle is the principle of dependence. I depend upon God for everything, life, my career, my daily bread, shelter, clothes, everything. Why? 1 Chronicles 29, 14, all things come of thee. When she trusted Satan, she broke her dependence of God. She violated the Sabbath principle. Honor thy father and thy mother. She dishonored God, her father, by going with Satan's command. Thou shalt not kill, commandment six. Sin is death. Are you with me? Sin is death. For as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Sin has death in it. Sin is suicidal behavior. And she committed that. Thou shalt not commit adultery. In spiritual involvement with any other being than God is spiritual adultery. Are you with me? That's what Babylon made the kings of the earth commit. Spiritual adultery and fornication. Choosing another God above the God of heaven and earth is, according to the Bible, adultery spiritually. She committed that. Commandment 7, thou shalt not steal. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
the world, finish it for me, and they that dwell therein. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? When she gave herself to Satan, all her resources, all her talents, her health, her intellect, she was stealing from God. Because you're not your own. Commandment 9, thou shalt not bear false witness. And we covered the coveting. She shattered the commandments. You begin to understand when you break one. Yes. Who is your God? Why are you not in church? Why don't you study God's word? Why is it you haven't read a book from Ellen White in 15 years? How is it you cannot defend a fundamental teaching of the church to which you were born? Because other things occupy our time. And so we donate two hours a week to God. That's the midday service because we always come late. And we call that a relationship with God. And then we want God, when he comes, to give us all of heaven. As a reward for two hours a week out of 168. As a reward for total ignorance of his word, we want heaven. As a reward for putting career, family, boyfriend, whatever, possessions ahead of him, we want heaven. I don't mean to be harsh. I have to keep saying that. I've been told I am. But I'm a nice man. Say amen. (laughs) Listen to me. Make up your mind tonight, 25 to 8. Who is your God? Who or what directs your life? Whose voice directs your life? If it's not the voice of God, change your gods tonight. Live by the voice of God. As we said last night, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, not Satan. Is God your God? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20. When he knocks, we're supposed to say, what do you want? And Jesus says, keep my commandments. When Adam sinned, consequences affected the physical world. Listen to me carefully. The ground was cursed. Genesis 3.17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now the ground became difficult to till. That's the result. Sin affects now the physical world. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. Plants began to bring forth thorns. Verse 16, Genesis 3. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children because of sin. A physical change took place in a woman's body. Childbirth became agony. Why am I saying that? Because you see, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the moral law, they are the foundation of the entire law system in the universe. So when they are violated, every other level of law suffers. Did you follow me? Let me say it again. The foundation of God's universal government is the Ten Commandments. When they are violated, every level of existence suffers. Because when the foundation shakes, the whole structure comes down. So when Adam and Eve sinned, particularly Adam, trees changed. Leaves began to fall. How come 
a tree is not a moral thing, but it was affected by a moral lapse because the moral law is the very heart and soul of the universe because it is the very heart of God. So animals became wild. And after the flood, God had to put the fear of man into animals, Genesis 9 verse 2. To prevent them from just eating them up and destroying them because only eight people came out of the ark. And the animals must have multiplied in the ark. So God put the fear of animals into man. Prior to that, there was no need for that before sin. My brothers and sisters, the foundation of God's universal kingdom is his law. Which is his heart. When Adam violated that law, the entire intergalactic cosmos, ecosystem, everything affected. And today, the same thing happens. We violate God's law. The earth is polluted. There's global warming. Every area of existence, every level of being is deteriorating. Because the law, the moral law, has been disregarded, broken, disrespected, spat upon, particularly by those who claim a relationship with God. Who is your God? Who is mine? Tonight, you and I can leave this place with the assurance and the certainty that the God who stood on Sinai and said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, we can leave with the certainty He is our God by a recommitting of the life to Him, by giving ourselves, placing ourselves under His beneficent rule, His law of life, His law of blessings. You know, last night I told you the book of Deuteronomy is divided into three main sections. Chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 4, verse 43, which deals with the, the deliverance from God. It travels and they're called to obey God, avoid, avoid idolatry. Then from chapter 4, 44 to 26, 19, all the civil and moral statutes. And that section is subdivided into two, 5 to 11, the 10 commandments, 12 to 26, laws guiding prophets and priests and kings and war and the feasts and you know, um, pre-purity and worship and all these things. And then, of course, the last section 27 1 to 31 30, the blessings of obedience, the curses of disobedience. Let me close the book as a sign that I am closing. Is the God of heaven and earth your God? Is the God of creation your God? If he is, then you must have already decided in your heart, I will obey his every word. When Jesus turned water into wine in Cana of Galilee, the mother of Jesus, Mary, said to the servants in John 2 verse 5, and what she said to them is for us because she's dead and they're dead. We need it. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. You don't have to study Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Akkadian, Swahili, or English. That is too simple and too easy. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And God has said one thing to all of us, which is love me. Then he says, here's how you love me. This way, and here's how you also love me. Here's how you treat your fellow man. He has given love. That's what I want. Then we say, how do I do it? Uh -huh. This way to show it to me. That way you also show it to me by showing it to your fellow man. The Ten Commandments. By the way, the law written in the Bible has no power. And I'm closing. But the law in the Bible, just words, it's a form. The power is Christ. Can you say amen? So when you look at the Ten Commandments, how, what, what are these things? What's this? When a person obeys it perfectly, what does the person look like? And what's the answer? Jesus Christ. If you're an architect, 
you draw plans for a building. And someone who can read plans, they see the bedroom, they see the bathroom, am I right? In those plans, they see where the wires go. They see, they see everything that makes a house a house, but you can't live in it. Then you go to the actual house that's built on the basis, and you say, ah, now that can benefit you. You can live in that house. You can shelter. But that house in which you can live is the same thing as that on the drawing board. The law of God is a blueprint. Jesus is the house. And we're to live in that house in order to be in conformity with the blueprint. Are you with me? Then God is our God. There are two voices in the world. The voice of God, the voice of Satan. You distinguish them by familiarizing yourself with this. And the heart and soul of this is God's moral law, which Christ lived out as a demonstration of what he meant when he spoke them on Sinai. How many of you will say with me, Father, help me to live my life by what you say and no one else can I see your right hand. I want you to raise your hand with your heart, not your muscles, your heart. Stand up with me, please. Let me let you go. Oh, God bless you, my brother. You were fast. Listen to the appeal again. Lord, help me to live my life by your voice and no one else's. That doesn't mean we don't listen to advice. I'm not saying that. God speaks to human beings. But we determine the accuracy of the words by the word of God. To the law, to the testimony, that's always the test. We're saying by standing, we want to live our lives by the voice of God and no other voice. Ellen White writes, um, Acts of the Apostles, page 68, paragraph 2. A thus saith the Lord must never be set aside for a thus saith the church or a thus saith the state. There are times when the church says thus and you shouldn't do it. There are many times the state says thus, and it should not be done. The Christian must always ask, did God say that? In the tradition of Peter and John, Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than man. That must be our theme, our marching orders. God rather than man. God rather than Satan. Is that your decision? Who is your God? The God of heaven and earth. Who is your God? The God of of heaven and earth, the creator who rested on the Sabbath day, God, the Father of Jesus Christ. Let him be our God. Not because we say it, but because from the heart we obey him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for its rebuke and for its power to heal and for the balm for our aches we find in it. Father, forgive us for the degree to which we have really been trying to serve two masters. To whatever extent, dear God, we have left you and drifted. By listening to another voice, we fully and freely apologize. And we ask you, God, forgive us for our folly. Grant us your spirit. The same finger that wrote the law, the spirit of God. That's why the law is spiritual. Grant us that spirit of the law. That works in Christ, that through the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ, we may find a natural desire to obey you. Our greatest joy will be to please you. As Jesus said, I do always the things that please him. Please, dear God, give us a heart that loves to obey you. Give us hatred for sin and everything that is of sin, so that it may be said of us, as it was said of Jesus. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Bless those who are weak, God. Give them special strength. Let the words we've heard remain in our hearts. Bring us back tomorrow night, we pray. But before that, watch over us tonight. May the angels that excel in strength protect us. Let us fall asleep thinking of Jesus. We offer this prayer from our hearts. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Please be seated as God's manservant sings for us. I will follow
for thee, my Savior, whatsoever my lot shall be. Where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. And though all men should forsake thee, by thy grace I'll follow thee. Though the road be rough and the thorny, trackless as the foaming sea, Thou hast trod this road before me, and I gladly follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all men should forsake thee by thy I'll follow thee. Though I meet with tribulations, sorely tempted though I be, I remember thou was tempted, and I rejoice to follow thee. Help me, please. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. And though all men should forsake thee, by thy grace I'll follow thee. I will follow. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all men should forsake thee, by thy grace I'll follow thee. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me, and though all should forsake thee by thy grace I'll follow thee by thy grace by thy grace I'll follow thee by thy grace I'll follow Amen. The only way to follow Jesus is to obey him. In Joshua 24, verse 24, all the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve and his voice will we obey. And those two statements mean the same thing. To serve God is to obey God. To follow God is to obey God. So I will follow thee, my Savior. And the following is the path of obedience from the heart. And so just before we pray, I want to ask you again, as genuinely and sincerely as I can, bring every area of your life under the umbrella of God's holy law. Obey God and God alone. Obedience is life. Disobedience is death. Romans 6.16 Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness, righteousness is life. Obey God. He'll give you the power to obey. Is it your desire by God's grace to obey him? Can I see your right hand? Let's stand for prayer. When the Sunday law is passed, we will more keenly appreciate what obedience is. Are you listening to me? There's a Sunday law coming. Those who violate it, they'll be under death penalty. 
Hopefully, like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, we would have come to the place in obedience where we prefer to die than disobey. And so the message of the church at Smyrna, Revelation 2.10 is for us. Be thou faithful unto death. That's the obedience God wants. That was the obedience Jesus gave in um, uh, Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And it doesn't stop there. Even the death of the cross, the worst form of death. That's the determination we must have. I will go to a lion's den before I disobey God. I will die before I disobey God. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, give us the faith of Jesus. Give us a heart that's made up to serve you. Made up so decidedly, dear God, that nothing will shake us. But to come to that point, Father, help us to understand we need to be faithful and obedient in the little challenges that come day by day. Bless everyone who came. Let the words remain on their hearts. Transform us into your image, dear God. And without losing one, save us when you come. Along with our families and those for whom we have labored, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please travel safely and God bless you. Come back tomorrow night.